Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I should be in the next hour or so. Yeah, no, absolutely, no, no problem. We'll get it, uh, we'll get it sorted. <coughs> uh, I've, I've already spoken to them, um, and they said it would be fine. So, um, of the Salvation Army North Street Citadel Corps along with my wife, Lieutenant Ken Daisy Barnes. I'd like to take this moment to welcome you all to our worship service. And I pray that as you tune in, that you'd allow the Spirit of the Lord to descend and to saturate your heart in such ways that you will be transformed. May God bless you and have a wonderful day. Holy God, bless our day of worship. Bless us, Lord. Dear Lord, as we rise to meet each new day, please let us be filled with your Spirit. Wherever we go, let us spread joy, love, peace, and goodness and faithfulness. Let us desire to become more like you and to worship you in all we do. Encourage our spirits and help us desire these things so much more than the sin that entices us. Thank you for always going before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Anoint our heads with oil. Holy God, I pray that you would saturate us in your presence. Father, we lift our burdens. Give us your peace. Holy God, we are available. Fall afresh on us. Join me in a call to worship. O oh Lord, before we were formed, you knew us. Before we were born, you consecrated us. You said that we were wonderfully made. And out of your image, you fashioned us. Before a word was on our tongue, you know it. You have laid your hand upon us. You breathed life into us and placed good gifts within us. You call us your masterpiece. You call us royal. You call us your prized possession. You delight in the wonder of our being. As we consider the magnitude of your love for us, we recognize that we are nothing without you. So we bow in humility to your Lordship. We lay our worship at your feet. Accept our offering of praise, O oh Lord, and reign in our hearts forever. Amen. <laughs>
say, by doing so, everything that is you, everything that you put in us has an opportunity to flourish and blossom and be fruitful. Because that's what you've called us to be as a church, to produce fruit that are loving and patient and kind and self-controlled. Today's scripture reading is taken from Esther chapter 4, verses 12 to 17, and may God grant us understanding as we hear from his word. They related Esther's words to Mordecai. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this? Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, assemble all the Jews who are found at Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maidens also will fast in the same way. And thus I will go in to the king which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and did just as Esther had commanded him. Hello folks and welcome to another Sunday of worship. A few weeks ago I shared with you about purpose and what it means to have purpose. I talked about how the Lord equips us with gifts and skills to achieve the purposes he has for us. But there is another aspect of purpose which the Lord also orchestrates, and that is positioning. So for a few moments, I want to share with you on the topic, positioned for purpose. If we truly believe that the steps of the righteous are ordered by God, then we must know that the place or the stage we are at in our lives right now are not by mistake. The Lord, who is God over every season of our lives, whether good or bad, has meticulously positioned each and every one of us so that he might accomplish something dynamic through us. You see, God can choose to accomplish his will either by divine intervention or miraculously, or through a time, a place, a space, or a position of influence that is conducive to the manifestation of his purpose. But the question we must ask ourselves is, are we positioning ourselves in alignment with God so that we can see the fulfillment of his will. In the scripture passage read, we met a young queen by the name of Esther. Esther is queen of Persia and she dwells in one of the most beautiful palaces flooded by handmaids and servants. Her beauty is adored and she's probably the envy of every woman in her town. But you see, life was not always this way for the young queen. Esther's parents had passed, leaving her an orphan. She was raised by her Jewish cousin Mordecai, who trained her up in the ways of the Lord. 
You see, many times when we look at this scripture passage, we skip across this little bit detail about Esther being an orphan. But if we unpack it further, we will recognize that as an orphan, Esther must have faced many difficulties growing up. Often when the Bible speaks of God's attitudes towards the orphan, words like defender, protector, helper, provider, and many others are used. So it is evident that orphans faced much ostracism and rejection in those days. They were probably mocked and teased, called all sorts of names, and like widows, they were looked down upon with little expectation for the future. This would have been the life of young Esther. But thank the Lord that it doesn't matter what man might say or how man might view us. Because men can say whatever they want, but Jehovah God has the final say over our lives. And if he determined that he will bless us, then blessing it will be. And if he chooses that he will exalt us, then exalting us he will do. And there is nothing no man on earth can ever do about it. And so here is Esther years down the line, enjoying the glory of the Lord. She has now become one of the most revered women of her, in her nation. And so that is why we have to be so careful when we see our brothers and sisters walking into their blessings because we do not know the blood, sweat, and tears they would have gone through as they patiently awaited God to make a way in their darkness. We do not know the struggles they would have faced. We do not know the achings of their past. And like the sing singer Sissy Whining said, we just don't know the cost of the oil in their alabaster box as they come before God just as they are. So here Esther is now in the palace enjoying the glory of her position. She is as safe as can be, treated to the very best. But on the outside, danger lurks around her people. An enemy of the Jews, Jewish people, seeks to an an annihilate its population. The problem, though, is that this enemy is Haman, the king's right hand. Haman is a power-hungry leader who despises the Jews because of their worship to God. So he devises a plan to persuade the king, Esther's husband, into his plot to destroy all the Jews. Now Mordecai is on the outskirt hearing the news. Esther has no clue what's happening in her town. And so Mordecai sends news to Esther pleading for her to ask the king for mercy on behalf of her people. But Esther is apprehensive. Now, some of you might be saying, this is easy for Esther. All she needs to do is go to her husband, make the request, or she can simply use her royal powers. But you see, times were different then. It was against the law for anyone to approach the king unless invited, even the queen. And so Esther, thinking of the law and the consequences she could face, began to think of her own life and her own safety. And so she sends back message to Mordecai with all the possible excuses she can give as to why she cannot help. But I love Mordecai's response to her. Mordecai says to her in verse 13 and verse 14 of Esther chapter 4, Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at a time as this, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. This is such a powerful statement because too often we can forget where we came from. And sometimes when the Lord creates opportunity or positions where we exalted, we get carried away. 
We become very manipulative with the influence we have, wreaking havoc and causing confusion, or we simply choose to use those powers for our own safety and our own gains. Instead of utilizing our gifts and our skills and our talents and our influences in ways that are good and pleasing to God and uplifting to the people. I tell you today, if you are in a position of such one with influence and you're misusing or abusing the, in, the influence or the power God has given to you, then woe be unto you to think that your acts are going unnoticed in the sight of God. Scripture tells us in James chapter 4 verse 17 that whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So here we are again with Mordecai recognizing that Esther is in the best position to bring deliverance for her people. And so he reminds her that maybe for such a time as this, God has placed her in this place, in this place as queen to accomplish the purpose of bringing deliverance to the Jews who are facing destruction. And he tells her, if you do not do it, you will suffer just as we do. In other words, Mordecai is saying to Esther, do not think for a moment that the mountain cannot be removed unless you do something. Or don't think that a need cannot be fulfilled without you. Because the God of all things, the provider God, the delivering God, the defender God will accomplish his will whether or not you get on board. And that is such a powerful statement to understand because we have to understand that God don't really need us. He is God all by himself and he can do what he wants to do with or without us. Yet he chooses to join in this beautiful partnership with us because of his love for us and the relationship he desires to have for us. And so we must be cognizant of what God is doing that we might bring ourselves in alignment with God so that he can glorify himself through us. Friends, the Lord can do extraordinary things through us. But if we are not sensitive to his spirit, we will miss out on the purpose he wants to fulfill through us and miss out on the wonderful experience of partnership with God. We have to throw off our pride. We have to throw off the mindset that it's all about me. And if I don't get the praise or be the star of the show, then I don't want to be any part of it. Because the truth of the matter is God wants to work with us. He desires this relationship with us. But if we don't, he will choose someone else to do the work. God must always get the glory in everything we do. It's never about us. It's always about God. And so if he decided to take our lives away today, those talents, those skills, those abilities, those power, that influence, they're all nothing, meaningless. So like Esther does in verse um, 17, she commits herself in prayer, in humble submission to the Lord, that she might receive his direction. Like Esther, we too can submit to the Lordship of God, that we might seek him for direction and ask him, how, Lord, how can I use my here and now to glorify you? How can I use my gifts, my influence, my power to glorify you? We have to submit in humility to God or our efforts will be useless in his sight. And what a sad thing it is that in the eyes of men, our prideful works are revered, but in the eyes of God, they are nothing. What is it worth to gain the world and lose our souls? Friends, today, I want to close this time here because I really want us to reflect on where we are in our lives right now. What tools do we have in our hands? What do we have to give? 
what don't we have to give, and how God can use all of that for his glory if we align ourselves in his will by being open and sensitive and discerning to what God wants to do through us. The Lord wants to use us. He wants a partnership and a relationship with us. And so we must seek him faithfully, earnestly, humbly, that he might receive the glory. Let our works glorify God. Let where we are in our lives glorify God, that we might see his perfect will be accomplished through us. The Lord bless you as you ponder on these words today, and may he reveal himself to us. Amen.